Howdy folks, and welcome to War Thunder with the Mighty Jingles. No, no, I'm not doing the annual War Thunder video joke anymore. I can't, I've run out of Back to the Future movies. <laughs> no, it's just a straightforward, honest to goodness, War Thunder realistic battle, this time with jets. More specifically, one jet in particular, this one. The US Navy's F9F8 Cougar flown by Zephex. Hang on a minute, Jingles. I'm a bit of an aviation buff and I could have sworn that the F9F was the Panther, not the Cougar, and you're absolutely right. Well, you're half right, because it's the Panther and it's the Cougar. What are you talking about? How can you tell the difference between the two? And what is the difference between the two? And why do they have the same designation? Well, they, the US Navy really didn't do themselves any favours where this or these aircraft are concerned. That, the F9F8, ooh, hold on to your lunch as uh, Zephex gets all fancy with the camera. That, the aircraft that Zephex is flying, is an F9F8 Cougar. From the F9F6 variant, all Panthers started being called Cougars. Because the US Navy decided that the Panther had changed dramatically enough by the time they got to the F9F6 variant that it warranted a new name. And after the F9F5 there were some fairly substantial um, physical differences between these different variants of what's essentially the same aircraft. To begin with, the most obvious difference, the F6, F7 and F8 all have that 35 degree swept back wing. Whereas the Panthers, the F2, 3, 4 and 5, all had straight wings with wingtip mounted fuel pods. To compensate for the loss of the fuel pods on the wingtips with the F6, 7 and 8, known as the Cougars, one of which of course ZFX is flying here, the aircraft was lengthened in the fuselage by about two feet to provide for additional fuselage fuel tankage. Despite this, the F9, F6 and 7 Cougars still had around about an overall 8% less maximum fuel capacity than the Panthers that preceded them with the wingtip fuel tanks. And that was one of the reasons for the introduction of this variant, the F9F8, which was lengthened even further and given even bigger internal fuel tanks. It also probably hasn't escaped your attention that this particular F9F8 Cougar is equipped with sidewinders. Now these are early infrared guided missiles, Fox 2, missile away. They're not all aspect you pretty much have to be in the rear quarter of the target and they do have a fairly short range but um, yeah if you can get a hit they get the job done oh French MD 450 spotted don't know if he was actually setting up for an attack on Zephex but if he was he made a bit of a dog's dinner out of it Zephex is in range of the F2 Banshee Fox 2 missile away checking his 6 the MD-450's managed to flip altitude on him, but he doesn't appear to be in pursuit. Although Zephex is above an enemy airbase at the moment, and he's starting to attract some flak. And the second Sidewinder did not make contact with the target. The Banshee is still up and undamaged. Oh, hang on a second. Meteor. Yeah, that's not good. He had the height advantage and is building up a speed advantage as he dives down on him in pursuit, although he appears to have picked up a problem of his own, whether or not he's aware of that, is anybody's guess. Is it just me, or are there a whole bunch of aircraft in pursuit of Zephex and his pursuer? So Zephex has a meteor on his tail, the meteor has a meteor on his tail, and the meteor on the tail of the meteor on the tail of Zephex's <laughs> cougar uh, appears to have the F2 Banshee, the MD450, and possibly also an F9 cougar of his very own on his tail. Wow. It really sucks to be popular. <laughs> However, the Cougar is fast. Zephex is almost going supersonic here. And while that meteor on his tail might have started with a height and energy advantage, he's having a real hard time keeping up. And now he's got problems in front and behind. An MD-450B of our own is taking him on, head on, and he still had that meteor on his tail. And he has very wisely decided, screw this. <laughs> I'm going to back off and wait for all of my friends to join me, and he has brought an awful lot of friends to this party. 
as FX turns to engage. First the F2 Banshee takes him out with the guns. Fox 2 fires a missile at the Meteor, but the Meteor is at a bad angle and the MD450 is actually presenting a much stronger heat signature and he eats the Sidewinder. Narrowly misses the Meteor. The Meteor manages to avoid, but the Meteor pilot probably knows that he can't outrun a Cougar in a dive and he's not even trying. What he is trying to do is set Zephex up for a kill from his wingman. Another Meteor, the Mark 8, who is in serious danger of overshooting. And maybe Zephex can help him out with that. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic. What a player. Here comes the first Meteor. Oh, and he's hit him. That is definitely critical damage, but is it a kill? Wait for it. Yep. It's a kill. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Zephex and the F9 F8 Cougar just aced himself in the space of about four minutes. The skies are clear of enemies. Oh, wait, no, I knew there was another Cougar around. He was at the tail end of the train that was chasing Zephex just a minute ago, which are now all scattered in various different burning pieces around the valley floor below. He's got meteor problems of his own, Zephex fires off his last remaining Sidewinder and it goes straight for the sun. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> that's actually not the worst thing that could have happened. And that sort of thing did happen with these early generations of infrared heat-seeking missiles. That missile basically went for the sun. It could have gone for the meteor. <laughs> and that would have been embarrassing. Um, you really do have to be careful with these things because they're not that smart as smart weapons go. At least they weren't in the early days. These heat-seeking missiles that we have in War Thunder, they're not the modern all-aspect sidewinders that we have today that can basically be fired and expect to hit a target providing it's within range, regardless of the angle that the target is presenting towards you. You might have seen movies of pilots armed with heat-seeking missiles like the Sidewinder. In the nose of the missile, there's a cryogenically cooled seeker head, and when it's armed, it starts looking for the hottest object in its field of view. And while it's doing that, you might recall hearing a sort of growling noise, which turns to a high-pitched tone once the missile is sure, relatively speaking, that it's acquired the target that you want it to go and kill, which, hopefully, will be the exhaust of an enemy aircraft. The problem, at least with these early generations of heat-seeking missiles is that it wasn't that difficult to confuse the seeker head. That's why infrared flares work. Oh, looks like the enemy Cougars had enough of running away. Not entirely sure why... Is he... He's out of ammunition, isn't he? I don't know what he's been shooting at, but... I'm pretty sure that guy's out of ammo, because he never even attempted to attack Zephex. If Zephex had a Sidewinder now, that guy would be dead. When he was climbing up to meet him, I think there's probably a 50-50 chance that the Sidewinder would have hit the enemy Cougar, or it would have just sailed off in an attempt to blow up the sun. <laughs> because, like I said, it was not very difficult to confuse these early heat-seeking guided missiles. And there are several recorded incidents, mostly during the wars in the Middle East, took place around and in Israel in the 60s and 70s of pilots getting a target lock on the exhaust of an enemy aircraft firing off the Sidewinder and having the Sidewinder go chasing the Sun instead. A particular problem if the enemy aircraft had the Sun behind it. But missiles were great of course. It was much easier to shoot down an enemy aircraft and much safer to shoot down an enemy aircraft with a missile uh, than it was with Canada machine guns. Unfortunately this reliance on missile technology, which wasn't quite mature enough to take the place of guns, did come back to bite the US Air Force in the arse, particularly during the Vietnam War. And this was personified in the otherwise excellent McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom, an absolute beauty of an aircraft. Well, not particularly beautiful to look at, but it had a certain rugged charm. It was tough, heavy, powerful, could carry a ridiculous weapons load, but it never had a gun. Now, if you were in an F-4 Phantom, and all of your Sidewinders had missed, and you didn't have a gun, you wouldn't be able to do that. 
and American pilots were finding exactly that problem was occurring to them in Vietnam because the missiles were great in theory but in practice the technology hadn't quite matured they just weren't reliable enough and not only that but American pilots weren't really training to use guns in air-to-air -air combat and so two things happened a gun pod was developed for the F-4 Phantom and we'll talk about the second thing that it led to in a moment because Zephex has been spending the last minute working his way around to conduct a correct attack on the Tu-4 there, which is basically just a Soviet reverse engineered version of the B-29 Super Fortress, attacking it from the front. Not doing what the Meteor that it's firing at was doing for at least the last three or four minutes and trying to attack it from the rear and eating all kinds of damage from its extremely accurate and deadly radar-guided tail-mounted cannon. And the Tu-4 is down, although Zephex wasn't credited with the kill, he instead got an assist. The kill went to the pilot of the Meteor, who probably earned it, and has probably taken a lot of damage for it. But back to the subject of air-to-air -air missiles, or the failure of American air-to-air -air missiles in the skies over North Vietnam in the 1960s. The second thing that this led to was the chief of US naval operations, um, a gentleman by the name of Admiral Thomas Hinman Moore, ordered Captain Frank Alt to research the failings of American air to air missiles over Vietnam. This Alt report concluded that aside from the failures of the technology, there was also far too little training being given to American pilots in air combat maneuvers. The kind of thing that you have to be pretty good at if you're going to shoot an enemy aircraft down with your guns. And as a direct result of the Alt report, on the 3rd of March 1969 at Naval Air Station Miramar in California, the United States Navy Fighter Weapons School was established. You might have heard of this place. There was a very popular movie in 1986 starring Tom Cruise, went by the name of Top Gun. Yeah, that's how it came to be. It wasn't the first fighter weapons school that the US Navy had. In fact, it wasn't even the first fighter weapons school that the US Navy had in the 1960s. Oh yeah, he is coming in pretty fast here, but it's fine, it's okay. The F9F8, uh, as you can see, is equipped with air brakes. He's going to be fine. There's no danger of a jingles landing here, folks. <laughs> but anyway, yes, back to the subject of fighter weapons schools. Like I said, it wasn't even the first fighter weapon school that the US Navy had in the 1960s. They had various different units called Fleet Air Gunnery Units that were established in the early 1950s, but had all been closed down by 1960. And they'd been closed down because with advances in radar, air-to-air -air missiles, fire control technology, there was a widespread belief that the age of the traditional dogfight was over. Well, events in the skies over Vietnam particularly during Operation Rolling Thunder, would put the lie to that particular theory. And so Top Gun was born. The idea was that pilots would be selected from frontline squadrons throughout the US Navy uh, and sent to learn from the instructors at the Fighter Weapons School. Most of these instructors, at least in the early days, were veterans of the Fleet Air Gunnery Units. And they flew A4 Skyhawks, which the US Navy had in abundance, a fantastic single-engine strike aircraft, and borrowed a bunch of T-38 Talons from the US Air Force to simulate the flight characteristics of the MiG-17 and MiG-21 respectively. Once the students had graduated from the Top Gun course, they would return to their squadrons, where they would be expected to pass on what they had learned to the other pilots within their squadron, basically becoming Top Gun instructors themselves. And it worked. It worked very well. The kill ratios over Vietnam of US Navy pilots increased dramatically, almost immediately. Between 1965 and 1967, US Navy pilots, sorry, aviators, were shooting down 3.7 North Vietnamese Air Force MiGs for every loss of their own. After 1970, just one year after the formation of the Fighter Weapon Training School, the kill ratio of US Navy pilots had climbed to 13 to 1. Who would have thought that training your pilots in air combat maneuvers drastically increased their success and survival rates when they got involved in air combat maneuvers. <laughs> I know, right? It sounds so obvious. And yet it is understandable. 
given the advances in radar, air-to-air -air missiles and fire control technology in the 60s and 70s, it's perhaps completely understandable that a lot of people thought that you just didn't need guns on aircraft anymore. Certainly the designers at McDonnell Douglas, responsible for the development of the F-4 Phantom, didn't believe that you needed guns on aircraft anymore. And the US Navy, who approved the design, and the US Navy and US Air Force, who bought them in vast quantities, also didn't believe that you needed guns on aircraft anymore. And they were all wrong. Turns out, guns are great. They're a lot more economical as well. I mean, I don't know how much a 20mm armour-piercing incendiary tracer shell costs, but I'm willing to bet it's a damn sight less than an AIM-9J Sidewinder heat-seeking air-to-air missile. And the other great thing about 20 or 30 millimeter cannon shells, aside from their economics, is the fact that they really only tend to go more or less exactly where you tell them to. Straight ahead. Guided missiles, on the other hand, even today, so imagine what it was like in the 50s and 60s, they're sometimes not quite as guided as we might like to think they are. Most of the time, they did tend to go more or less in the general direction of whatever it was they swore they'd locked onto, but sometimes... Sometimes they didn't. <laughs> and then it's brown alert time. So hooray and huzzah for guns. And for learning how to use them properly. Guns are great. One enemy left. I just want to point out there were only nine enemies to begin with in this particular realistic battle. And Zephex has shot down six of them and got an assist on one. And now he's going for the B-57, which is basically just a Canberra, but flown by the US Air Force, with a couple of modifications. He's got guns in the front for one thing. He's never going to get that B-57 with missiles, for two very good reasons. One, the angle's bad. I mean, he might get a lock on, but the missile might decide to engage the meteor instead halfway there. And also, he doesn't have any missiles. They weren't rearmed. Although technically you could argue that this was in fact a missile kill. <laughs> it's just that the missile involved was his F-9F Cougar aircraft. Either way, that was his seventh kill in a War Thunder jet realistic battle where there were only nine enemy aircraft to begin with on the entire enemy team. And he got an assist on number eight. So, Johnny Good Show. Well done, old boy. Very entertaining to watch, particularly the mad slaughter in the dogfight at the beginning of the battle. And uh, thank you so much for sending that one in. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.